James Lynch here for Middle Easy, joined by Violent Bob Ross. Luis Pena is going to be taking on Alex Munoz at UFC Vegas 24 on April 17th. Luis, how are you, man? I'm doing great, James. You know, uh, I actually just got done training here a little while ago, so I'm going to shower, eat up as soon as we get off uh, off this um, this interview. But I appreciate you having me on, man, as, as always. Yeah, no, I appreciate you uh, taking the time. Uh, before we dive into this, just want to remind our guests, uh, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. It always uh, supports the channel very easily by doing that. But uh, let's talk about you, man. I know some bad luck, right? You were supposed to fight your car close back in February. Uh, as cornerman test positive. I know you said you'd pretty much fight anyone. I'm assuming April was the earliest time slot they could foot you in, or what sort of happened there after the, the whole COVID thing with uh, Drakkar? From my side of things, you know, we were supposed to fight on uh, the 21st. And instead of getting us going like that very next week, they were trying to book us for March, the March 6th card. And for whatever reasons, uh, the negotiations fell through. And then a couple of days later, you know, my, my manager hit me up with the Munoz offer. Okay, so that's interesting. Because I know Drakkar's fighting Jeremy Stevens, so I wasn't sure if they tried to rebook the fight or what happened there. But I guess you're just happy to fight, right? It doesn't matter who you're fighting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at this point, having you know sat out for as long as I have and gone through the uh, suspension, having to deal, deal with the fines and everything, I'm just I'm just excited and ready to get back in there and start making some more money. When did you find out about this matchup specifically? It seemed like you got some notice for it. I would think this time around. Uh, yeah. So I uh, I so I want to say almost exactly six weeks away out from. From when we will, will fight is when I was uh, I was notified about Munoz, so I, I mean I've had a, a decent camp. You know, it's, it's been one of the actually it's probably been my first full camp for an opponent out of American Top Team. Now that I think about it. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, we have actually haven't actually talked since you made the move from AKA in California over to Florida. I know it was financially as well because I know you were mentioning to me before like how expensive it is to live in California. Like, what was sort of the reason for for making the trip? Was it just financial, or were you looking to get a different look? What was sort of the the main culprit? Oh no, without a doubt, it was. I mean, I, I hate to say it like this, but it was most one hundred percent financial. You know, um, I couldn't really like. It's it's very very expensive in the Bay Area, especially kind of like where where aka is situated it's like almost in the heart of silicon valley so it's like very very expensive and like it was just starting to get to a point where i couldn't find um reliable housing that was like that was affordable you know Mm -hmm. so um talking to my managers and everything and kind of just uh giving them the telling them the situation they gave me a couple of different options and moving out here to american top team seemed like the most um, the smartest one. How long has it been now since you've been in Florida? Uh, a little bit over a year. So I moved. We I moved here in December of 2019. Okay, so, gotcha. Which goes to show you how long it's been since we've done an interview, man. But that's that's great, and I'm I'm glad to see it's all worked out well. What would you say has been the biggest difference training at AKA to training at ATT? Um, I know there's way more people to train with. I would think at American Top Team, just how big that gym is. I would say for me the biggest difference has been just like the level of hands-on um, approach that the coaches take to everything. You know, um, at AKA, and I mean I'm not taking like saying like in a bad way, but at AKA, you know, it was kind of the honest was on me to make my schedule and to know when I was going to be going to practice, to know when I was going to be training, all this and all that, you know, to, to figure that out. It was all on me to figure everything out as far as that. But here at ATT, I, I went in, I told Conan, hey, look, this is the date I'm fighting, this is the opponent, and these are the coaches I'd like to work with. A couple of days later, I, he texted me a picture of my schedule, you know what I mean? So it was nice to not have, like, I don't have to deal with any of that, you know what I mean? I just wake up and I know where to go, and, like, my coaches are there. So it's really nice, like, not having to worry about um you know, my training sessions, uh, especially the ones that are outside of like our team practices and all that, you know, having to set up all your extra work and all that kind of stuff, like just being able to just show up and, you know, it's going to be there. It's really, really nice. Let's talk about your opponent here, Alex Munoz, four and one record. What do you know about him? How do you feel like you match up against him here? Um, I mean, yeah, I know he's, uh, he's a really, he's a really good wrestler, um, wrestle for Oklahoma state. And he trains out of American Top, or not American, but uh, Alpha Male and um, and CSA, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, he likes to move around a lot. You know, he's, his his hands aren't terrible, but I, I don't think he's got a lot of power, or not necessarily that he doesn't have a lot of power. 
so much as he hasn't realized like how to sit down on his punches and, and everything. It takes a little while to figure that out. Um, I don't know. I think this is a really good stylistic matchup for me just because like I know he's – to in order for him to get to where he wants to be in this fight, he's going to have to come forward and, and he's going to have to get in my face and try to fight me. And uh, I think that really – that that bodes well for me, you know, because I, I just – I don't like chasing guys down. I hate having to go and, and fight someone that doesn't want to fight. So um, – when I got a guy like this that I know is going to come forward and, and he's going to have to come get in my face to try and win, it makes these things easier for me. Who are you getting to work with? I know it's a big gym. We could be here all day if we listed everyone at your gym, but uh, is there anyone you're working with a little bit more than others for this fight? Um, I worked a lot with, I've worked a lot with Mateus Gamrot. He's, uh, he's fighting next Scott week. Scott Holtzman. Yeah, I know. Yeah. 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 Uh, me and him actually became really, we were, me and him are like really good friends. Uh, he came up here, two or three months ago uh, in the dorms. And so, like, slowly but surely, we kind of, like, bonded and made, like, this real cool friendship. Like, he's one of the few dudes that I actually hang out with here in the dorms and everything. So I got a lot of work with him. Um, Dustin, actually, Dustin Poirier came back in town for, a, a, like, a week or two and uh, helped me out a lot, gave me some rounds. I've been working with Sydney Outlaw, uh, Lamar Brown. Really, I just, I've been working with everybody I can get. Um, get get a hold of. Uh, got a little bit of work with Jorge, you know. So it's it's kind of that's and then once again that's like a big big plus about being here at American Top Team. Big benefit is just the amount of of training partners we have access to, and then the guys that that want to come in, you know. Um, I got to play a little bit of Aljamain Sterling for uh, for Peter Yan for that whole camp, you know, and they kept requesting to work with me, so it was really nice, you know what I'm saying to. Uh, to get to work with someone of that caliber as well, even if he is smaller than me. Weight cut. How's that going? I know you're a big guy. I still don't know how you make... I, first off, I don't know how you made 145, and then I don't know how you even make 155. You are huge. You're way bigger than I am, and I'm like 200 pounds, but I'm also not a pro athlete either. That's funny, man, because everybody says that. Everybody asks me, oh, how, how's this weight cut? And I I legit wish I could have... I should... I, this next time, I'm going to document this next weight cut just to show people how easy it is for me so people stop trying to tell me to move up. I literally didn't cut weight for the last fight. Like I, I Okay. Like, I, I, like, okay. In the sense that for me, cutting... What I, what I consider cutting weight is like the last five pounds or the last two pounds where you got to go and sit in the sauna or put a sauna suit on and like really push yourself to get through it. But for the most part, like all I did was work out all week normally and then um, slowly kind of like taper my food and, and water intake. And then that last night, I pretty much, I went to sleep two pounds over and woke up on weight. Gotcha. And by the way, I ask every fighter how their weight cut's going, so it's not you specifically. But uh, I, I, I know, I know that could be annoying though, because I know that's something that people have asked you before. Because you are, you are just a gigantic guy, and I mean that with all the all the respect in the world. Um, your corner, who will be in the cage with you that night in terms of, uh, yeah, your your cornerman and all that. So I have uh, our head jiu jitsu coach Pahumpa, Marcos Damada, uh, King Mo. And my boxing coach Gabriel De Oliveira. Um, I don't know, I'm, uh, you know, pretty much the same crew I roll with every time for most of these fights. The American Top Team. Unfortunately, I haven't. This will be the first time Pahumpa has been able to be in my corner. Um, just you know, the last time uh, when I was supposed to fight Kama, or when I fought Kama, he was uh, he ended up testing positive for COVID, so he got quarantined and couldn't corner me. And then the last time, um, I forgot, someone was fighting, someone else was fighting, and he couldn't make it. And then um, something happened the, with my very first fight when I was originally supposed to fight Munoz. And so I'm, re- I'm just really excited to be able to have Pahupa there because like, if you watch when we when I spar and he's in my corner, it's pretty much like Pahupa's playing a video game, you know what I mean, especially on the ground. You know, I'm really, really like I, I find his voice really easy. I'm really good at listening and just doing exactly what he says. How's this fight playing out on April 17th? How do you feel like it's going to unfold? I feel like it's probably I, – I, I think I'm going to go in there. I'm going to show people um, – you know, the violent Bob Ross, everyone's been waiting to see, you know, I feel like, um, with the hype that I had surrounding me coming in off the ultimate fighter and like just everything, there was a lot of expectations on me and people were expecting to see, um, you know, just 
things that I know I'm capable of and people know that I'm capable of, but I just wasn't performing the way I wanted to or the way they wanted people wanted me to as far as like my UFC career. And I feel like a part of that has been, you know, adapting to being in the UFC, um, adapting to like the level of competition and then also like adapting to the gym changes that I've made where it was like AKA and then ATT. And then like a lot also at the same time, people not really taking into account that like I was only four fights into my professional career when I got signed. So like, I'm just, I'm taking this one as like kind of like my breakout party. Like this is going to be the one where I finally, like, I feel like I'm going to put it all together and get past the, the kind of the, uh, the freshman like hiccups I was having in my first couple of fights with the UFC just because, you know, I was like kind of working out the kinks of being, um, you know, an inexperienced green professional. I want to talk about marijuana. I know last year, unfortunately, you got suspended for marijuana. I know USADA has changed some rules a little bit, but, uh, you know, it seems like people are getting a bit more educated. It's a lot better than popping pills, right? It is. Don't get me wrong. Like, it, it is encouraging because, like, at the end of the day, I don't necessarily see a problem with it. I don't see where um, where you could say there's a problem with me going in there high or you could say it's like a performance enhancing or whatever. I legitimately – I don't see the uh, – like the the negative side effect to it. However, I can kind of understand as far as like from a marketing standpoint, like how there are just people out there that aren't educated. They're not they they don't understand the nuances around marijuana. So that it, it just like marijuana in any ways uh, being associated with the UFC is going to look bad to them. So like, I I can get that, but like. The one thing that gets me is like how everyone was really happy and like everyone was like all up in arms when um, USADA and the UFC announced that they had stopped testing for marijuana or whatever, which is cool and all, but that doesn't stop the Nevada State Athletic Commission from coming after you. Um, and apparently, my manager told me um, that because what the way they're doing it now is USADA actually comes to your room. And test you before the fight. The, at the the morning of the fights, they test you beforehand, and then they apparently send the results off to Insac as well. And um, I found out that that fight with Drakkar, I got lucky. Apparently, if I would have competed, I would have got suspended again because from Nevada, off of a test from USADA, where they didn't supposedly didn't even test for marijuana. Weird. Okay. Yeah, so there's, so there's still some issues there, obviously. Yeah, there's there's a lot of issues there because at the, what people don't get is that the 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 sanctioning, the discipline doesn't come down from the UFC or USADA at all. It's, it's Nevada, it's, uh, yeah. It's Nevada. The only thing I had with USADA, I had to um, I had to do like a drug counseling thing. With what this, really? Yeah, I had to I had to go through a, like a drug a drug counseling like video interview with this psychologist or psychologist. What? Psych- yeah, this is two thousand and twenty one. This isn't like nineteen like seventy, even nineteen eighty. I mean, this is crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's like I I'm the one that made the the mistake to and got yeah. And, but for whatever reason, it was just kind of like really like yeah. y'all like. This is, I, I, it's whatever. All right. I, I, you know, I went through it and I don't really had, I didn't really have a big problem with the guy. He seemed like a cool enough dude. And then as far as like the way they handled it, I didn't really see any backlash from Usada or the UFC. So I could care less when it comes to that. But at the end of the day, it's like, man, the, the fact that like Nevada can do this and they have no real recourse for why, and especially now that the 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 main promotion and third party testing um, branch like doesn't even care, it's like what is Nevada's uh, what what are they getting out of this? You know what I mean? Other than money, it's crazy. Um, one thing I wanted to bring to your attention, I don't know if you're aware of this. You know, remember Elias Theodoro used to fight in the UFC. He fought Ooh. regionally a couple of weeks ago. Did you know that he's the first athlete to compete with the therapeutic use exemption for marijuana when he competed? Did you know this? 
I didn't know that. Yeah. So BC, the British Columbia Athletic Commission, which is uh, in, in Canada, obviously in Vancouver, um, they uh, yeah they now allow it cert- with certain people. If you if you file for an exemption and you have the right paperwork, you can actually get an exemption. So Elias fought with that this exemption. It's never been done in MMA history. Hearing that, does that make you feel a little bit better knowing the future of what maybe these other commissions can get their act together? Yes. Yeah, no, I mean, it's cool and all, but at the end of the day, and I'm sure Elias would say the same thing, like in a perfect world, he should have never needed that. Exactly, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, in my opinion, it, I, I like to me, it's like, dude, we're grown men, we're grown adults, you know what I'm saying? We're grown men, grown women, going in there and you're like, you're allowing us to punch each other in the head, like choke each other unconscious. The main... Um, the crux of the whole sport is to cause, you know, physical harm to another person, but we can't like be high. Like I could technically, if I wanted to, I could walk into the cage drunk and you guys would never know. And I'm, I'm fine. You know what I mean? There's nothing, nothing happens. It's true. Yeah, it's totally backwards. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that because I didn't know if you were aware, but at least, I mean, if we want to take a silver lining out of this, you know, crazy system, and I know it's still going to take a lot of work, at least there's one commission out there that's kind of, you know, saying, hey, this is what we're doing. And hopefully, it, hopefully they don't even need an exemption. It's just like, it's just treated as, as alcohol is, right? So that's the goal. But, and see, here's another point, though, that I, I thought of while I was going through all of this, or this whole sanctioning, too, especially for right now, the way they're handling it during COVID. They, the, the whole reasoning is that they don't want any of us fighters to go into the cage high, yet the way they're, the, the protocol they're using right now, pretty much, like, if I wanted to, I could go into the cage high and they would never know. Because, because, of, because of when they test you, right? Exactly. They're testing us the morning of the fight beforehand, and they never test again after that. Okay. Well, my last fight, when I was supposed to fight Drakkar, I got tested at 9 a.m. Right. And I had a bag of weed in my room ready to go after the fight. So if I really wanted to, I could have went in there high as, as giraffe pussy, and no one would have said anything or even known. Interesting. So it's like... Just goes to show the rules are, yeah, exactly, very flawed yeah, in, in the system yeah. they have. Just goes to show that, like, there really isn't, like, a rhyme or reason to anything they're doing. What was your thoughts on Nagano beating Stipe? Were you expecting that? Did you expect it to be that dominant? What was your takeaway from watching that performance on Saturday night? I think that was probably one of the bi- biggest examples of a guy, like, and I'm talking from Nganu from uh, before the steep, the first steep Bay fight all the way to now, I think this is the biggest example of a guy buying into his own hype, believing in everything else everyone was saying about him, falling because of that, and then like learning those lessons, actually taking the time to learn those lessons, come back, improve things, you know, humble himself. Because normally when a guy like buys into their own hype like that, it's all you never see them like turn it around. You know what I mean? It's always it, – it's it, they turn it tend to turn into like excuses, you know what I'm saying, rather than going and facing the fact that like, yeah, dude, I, I went in there and I, I thought I was going to do it, but I didn't. You know, it's always guys come up with the excuses. And I think France is one of the first dudes that legitimately was like, you know what? Yeah, no, nah, I bought into my own hype. And now I got I paid for it. So now I got to figure this out. And I think that's what we saw. We saw a, guy, uh, a, a humble dude go out there after learning those lessons and, and, um, and showing what he really is made of. And I think, I mean, you can't take anything away from Stipe because he's accomplished what he was able to accomplish in his career. But I think it's going to be very, very hard to take that belt away from a Francis Ngannou like that. I agree. Luis, thanks so much for the time. Really appreciate it. Anyone watching this interview, hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, where can people get a hold of you on social media, man? And any sponsors or shout outs? I'll give you the last word. You can always get a hold of me at Violent Bob Ross, all one word, Twitter and Instagram. And then Violent Bob Ross, Luis Pena on my, uh, on my Facebook page. And then uh, I just want to give a big shout-out to my sponsors, Near Fall, Lace and Loop, uh, Combat Corner, uh, Martial Luxury. They've all really kind of come together to help um, back me throughout these last this, – this whole 
um, ordeal I've been going through with the with being suspended and having to take this time off. You know, I've had uh, a lot of support from them, and I just want to say thank you guys for everything. And, and of course, thank you to the fans and everyone that that supports us. You know, can't do it without you guys. 